A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens Stave 2 The First of the Spirits Part 2 for her betrothed who is late again. Who is she? Oh, Belle. We were engaged and we were both young and, and had little money. I am sorry for my lateness. I will make it up. It matters little to you. Very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one, until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you. Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am that which promised happiness when we were one in heart. It's fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this. I will not say it is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight, if this has never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You think not. What a terrible and safe reply! May you be happy in the life you've chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight in to torture me? One shadow more. No more. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. Darling, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. I don't know. Um, Mr Scrooge? Mr Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear. And there he sat, alone. Quite alone. Quite alone in all the world, I do believe. Poor, poor wretched fellow. Anyway, <clears throat> let us not dwell on him. Come, come. Shall we fetch the children and have a jolly night of carols by the fire? It's Christmas Eve, my dear. <laughs> Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright and dimly connected that with its influence over him. He seized the extinguisher cap and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so the extinguisher covered its whole body form. But 
Though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light, which streamed out from under it in an unbroken flood upon the floor. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. A Christmas Carol, adapted, directed, and produced by Paul A.T. Wilson. Narrator, Paul A.T. Wilson. Scrooge, Oliver Fry. Ghost of Christmas Past, Jack Braiding. Belle, Emma Turner. Belle's husband, Paul A.T. Wilson. Music, David Pudney. Sound design, Paul A.T. Wilson. Copyright 2021. This production is published under the International Creative Commons Attribution License Version 4.